account. Uh, did you get a sense of deja vu? We've been here before, haven't we? Because just two chapters before, we had the feeding of the 5,000. Feeding of the 5,000, here is the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, and just like then, we're in the middle of nowhere. And just like then, Jesus has compassion on the crowd. Uh, and just like then, there's uh, no food, just what seems to be about a packed lunch. And just like then, the disciples are grumpy and unwilling. And just like then, Jesus satisfies a hungry crowd and more. Only then, uh, a crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. And now, it's seven loaves and a, smooth, uh, and a few small fish for a crowd of 4,000. And on both occasions, they collect up the leftovers, don't they? There were 12 baskets then. Here are seven baskets. So the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. What's it all about? Why does Mark record an almost identical miracle? And why is he recorded in a way in which the parallels are obvious? If you put them side by side and you read them, they just seem to, to parallel each other. It's very deliberate. So why has he done it? Well, some have said that actually these are different accounts of the same miracle. You see, Mark is writing a generation after these events. Uh, but the fact is there's just one event. And uh, the people who were there, well, some started, as it were, whispering. And, and that story went off in that direction. And some over here, they were there. And they started whispering. And that story went off in, in that direction. And then two sort of garbled stories came to Mark's ears sort of 30 years later. And someone was saying, well, it was, it was five loaves. No, it was seven. It was 5,000 people. No, it was 4,000 people. And really, it's just two different accounts of the same miracle. So what does Mark do? Well, rather than have to sort of make a judgment as to which one it is, he simply says, well, let's put, let's put it all, let's put it down as two separate miracles. And then we can keep both stories alive, as it were, uh, when actually it was just originally one miracle. After all, Mark's gospel um, is really Peter's eyewitness account, isn't it? And Peter must be getting on a bit. And maybe Peter's a bit confused. You know what it can be like? I, I used to sit on the city with my, watching a film with my father-in-law, and he'd say, oh, do you remember that film? Oh, it, it, what's it called? And he'd say, it stars, uh, oh, dear, what's his name? <laughs> and uh, he used to be in that, oh. I can't, and we'd, we'd have a 15-minute conversation about a, a film he couldn't remember starring someone we'd both forgotten. Well, maybe that's Peter. He's just sitting there thinking, oh, you know, he's got the big things, right? You know, there's Jesus, and there's a crowd, and there's loaves, and there's fishes. He's got the big things, right? But he, he just can't remember the details. Oh, God, was it 5,000? Was it 5,000? Was it 4,000? Was it 12 baskets? Or was it seven baskets? And so as it were to cover his tracks, Mark says, well, let's tell you what we do. We'll put them down as separate miracles. When actually, originally, it was just one. So is this just one event that's been recorded twice over? And the answer, of course, is no. And one of the reasons is the reason we gave at the start of this series, and that is the accuracy and the reliability of Mark's account. And if you want to know why we can take Mark's word for it, then the sermon, it's the first in the series, is on the website. But the second reason is found in Jesus' words, isn't it? In chapter 8 and verses 19 and 20, what does Jesus say? Um, verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. In other words, Jesus himself says, here are two distinct miracles. There were five loaves for 5,000, and then there's another miracle with seven loaves for 4,000. So why does Mark record an almost identical miracle? Do you remember the words of John at the end of his uh, gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and John says this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then right at the end of his gospel, he says, Now, there were also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain all the books that would be written. 
John says there were so many other things that Jesus did, and we just haven't the room to write them all down. So if there are so many things that Jesus did, why does Mark choose to record two miracles that seem almost identical? When he could have talked about so many other miracles that Jesus did. Why has he put them down? What's he getting at? Because it must be important, mustn't it? Well, hold on to that for a moment. And let's just actually look at what happened. So chapter 8, verse 1. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. Now, where are we? Well, we're on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, chapter 7, verse 31, tells us we're in the region of the, of the Decapolis, the ten cities. Uh, it's not a very Jewish area. It's decidedly mixed. It's an area where there are many non-Jews, Gentiles, people from other nations, people like you and me. And so this great crowd is full of Gentiles, full of non-Jews. After all, says Jesus in verse 3, some of them have come from far away. That's a significant thing for him to say. They've been with him three days. They've been lapping up his teaching. But now they're hungry, hungry, hungry. And says Jesus, I, I just can't send them away. I feel for them. Verse 2, I have compassion on the crowd. Verse 3, if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And he sort of, as it were, gathers his disciples and says, we've got a problem here. But Jesus' words to his disciples fall on deaf ears. Verse 4, and his disciples said to him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? The disciples say, it's not our problem. And if they're suffering from compassion fatigue, more extraordinary still is that, is that disciples can't add two plus two, can they? Because you think, well, haven't we been here before? Haven't these disciples witnessed the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes? Didn't Jesus actually then give the loaves and the fishes and put them in the hands of the disciples? And as they handed those loaves and fishes out, wasn't there bread enough for everyone? Weren't they the ones when they gave it up, they saw the, the bread and the fish multiply in their hands and, and then uh, no one went home hungry. Everyone was full. And didn't these same disciples, didn't they puff and sweat as they each carried a basket collecting up all the leftovers? Come on, disciples. If it happened then, why not now? And all they can say is, oh, what can you do in a place like this? How can, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And Jesus must be thinking to himself, here we go again. No wonder he says in verse 21, do you not yet understand? They just don't seem to get it, do they? Well, verse 5, um, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. He directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. So Jesus takes the little. It's no more than a picnic lunch. He gives thanks. He breaks the bread. He breaks the fish. It's deja vu, isn't it? He gives it to the disciples for the disciples to give to the crowd. And as they move through the crowd, distributing the food, there is more than enough for everyone. Verse 8, and they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. The seven loaves, the few fish, never run out. Nobody goes home hungry. Everyone has as much as they want. They ate and were satisfied. Because when you dine with Jesus, there is always more than your heart could wish. When he lays his table, such is his generosity, there are always leftovers. In fact, there are seven baskets of leftovers. A fabulous banquet 
in the wilderness. It's like Jesus turns a desert into a garden. And it also says, Mark, how many were there? Verse 9, and there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. 4,000, wow. So let's go back to our question. Why does Mark record this duplicate miracle? What's he getting at? The feeding of the 5,000, who are they? They're Jews. And here is their Messiah. Here is the shepherd king. Which is why when you look um, at that miracle of the feeding of 5,000, Mark says things in a very deliberate way. Mark says he has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. It's also why Mark says um, he makes um, the people sit down on the green grass. After all, that's what sheep need, isn't it? Green grass. And it's why, says Mark, they all ate and were satisfied. You see the feeding of the 5,000. Here is the shepherd of the sheep. Here is the shepherd king of Israel. And Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, I shall not go hungry. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The echoes are, are deliberate. And that miracle there, there are 12 baskets of leftovers. Why? Because there are 12 tribes of Israel. And the shepherd king provides more than enough for the people of Israel if they will but come and hear his voice and a sheep follow him the shepherd. That's what that miracle is about. But is Jesus just the shepherd of Israel? No, says Mark, he is also the saviour of the world. And here in this episode, the feeding of the 4,000, we have the world coming to Jesus in microcosm. We're on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We're away from a, a Jewish region. This is a Gentile region. And here the nations come. That's why Jesus says, and some have come far away. There's all sorts of echoes there of, of prophecies about Messiah, of people coming from far away to him, and hence the significance of 4,000. Because four in the Bible is, is shorthand for the world. That's why we have the parable of the sower, and there are four types of soil. That's why we talk about the four corners of the earth, the four winds, the four points of a compass, you know, never eat shredded wheat, north, east, south, west. Four is global in its scope. Mark is saying, Jesus isn't just the Jewish Messiah. He's much bigger than that. Here's the saviour of the world. Here's the one who's come to put things right for all the nations, for all people. And with seven baskets of leftovers, and we could talk about the number of seven and how that's significant, there is more than enough for everyone. That's the message. Jesus taking a miracle, something has happened, and is speaking um, with a louder voice than we perhaps might first understand when we read it. And even as you read the account, Mark is drawing on all those wonderful prophecies that speak of the coming one, the Messiah. Because you read of him coming, the Messiah will come uh, into our desolate world. There's that word desolate. It's, they, the disciples say it's a desolate place. And you can look at it, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 53, Messiah coming to a desolate world where he turns a desolate world, uh, turns a desert uh, into bloom. He's come to heal des desolate lives, desert lives, and make them live. So, my friend, do you get it? So, what Mark is saying, he's saying this good news of Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews. It is for the world. Or maybe what might make more sense to us, it's not just good news for those who are born into these things. Here is good news for everyone, regardless of your background, regardless of what religion you come from, regardless of what you believe. Even if these things have never, ever crossed your minds, here is the Savior we all need. Now, who is this Jesus? How can you feed 4,000 people 
with seven loaves of bread. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Who is he? And of course, he's the answer. The answer is he's the one through whom all things were made. He's the fire that burns behind all reality. He is the God who is there. The God who became a man and entered our world. And Jesus is his name. Who else would be doing these things? Or maybe you're thinking, well, I've come here this evening, and we're reading Mark's Gospel, but frankly, I don't believe it. I don't believe in miracles. Miracles don't happen. Maybe even say, look, science has disproved such things. Well, I can't perform miracles, and you can't perform miracles, because neither you or I are God. But how does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the God of order created an ordered universe. The lawgiver made a universe governed by laws, laws which science can measure and understand, laws which are intelligible and predictable. So if I take the glass of water and I hold it and I let it go, you all know what's going to happen next. Or if I take the glass of water and I throw it, you all take a vase of action. It's intelligible, it's predictable. You know how those laws work. And they work like that because they are made by a creator who is a God of order and a law giver. But it's not science that's sovereign. God is. And if today... God wants to change the way he does things. He wants to to change the way things work to feed 4,000 people, to make a point. Of course, it's no surprise that science can't keep up. God is free to change the usual way he does things because his laws aren't sovereign. He is. Anyway, what sort of God were you expecting? Don't you want a God who really is God? A God who is all-powerful. There's nothing that he cannot do. And don't you want a God who is a God of compassion, who changes the way he usually does things, the way he usually works, to feed a hungry crowd? And don't you want a God who's not out of reach, but a God with a human face, who speaks, who relates, who understands. And don't you want a God who comes into our desolate world, our desolate lives, to fill our emptiness, to turn the desert into a paradise? What does he say? I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. But he doesn't send them away hungry. Verse 8, they ate and were satisfied because that is the God that he is. Now, my friend, if I said to you, are you hungry? I don't mean physically hungry that hunger that's inside. The cynic in you might say, well, there goes the preacher. I know what you're going to say. Are you hungry? Jesus satisfies the soul. But if I said to you, are you empty? Maybe the honest person in you might say, well, go on. And perhaps to fill your emptiness, you've been too easily satisfied. (coughs) Maybe you tried everything. Maybe you tried different religions, different things, different relationships, different somethings. And still you're empty. Are you empty? But no one who comes to Jesus, no one who came to Jesus, was ever sent away empty. He really is the one that you're looking for, even if at the moment you 
don't know that he is. Because he's the one who fills our emptiness. Verse 10, immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. So we come to our second episode, more, more briefly now. Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee. He goes from east to west. He leaves a, quite a Gentile region and he arrives in a Jewish region. And guess who's there to greet him? They're always there, it seems to be, breathing down his neck. It's the Pharisees. The ultra-Orthodox, ultra-religious, strict Pharisees. And read verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. So the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and they seek a sign from heaven. Why? Well, at face value, it's not an unreasonable request, is it? Jesus talks, he acts. In fact, we've been talking about it this, uh, this evening as though he's God's man for the hour. Well, is he? Give us some proof, say the Pharisees. We need a, a miracle, a sign, a something. Not unreasonable, is it? Reasonable? Well, actually, says Mark, no, it's unreasonable. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign to test him. What does Mark mean? To test him. I used to work with a girl who was a world champion gymnast. I never, saw any, I never saw her do anything to prove that she was a world champion gymnast until one day we were standing outside the biology labs and she did a backward somersault. But it wasn't just that she did a backward somersault, she just landed perfectly on her toes with such poise and elegance and there was no swaying around and then she did it again. Wow. You told me you're a world champion gymnast. Now I believe you're a world champion gymnast. What more proof did I need? But suppose I'd said, mm, okay, right, mm, fair enough. Do it again. I want more proof. That would be testing her. That despite what she's said and despite what I've seen, really in my heart of hearts, I don't believe she's a world champion gymnast. I would be testing her, and that's what's going on here. That's what the Pharisees are saying. Look, okay, you seem to be the man sent from God, but actually, we don't really believe that. But how much more proof do they need? Think of it, as we've been going through Mark's Gospel, Jesus heals with a touch. He casts out demons with a word. He even raises the dead. There are whole towns that Jesus has visited and there's not a family in that town that haven't been touched, changed, healed by Jesus' ministry. And we don't mean people coming to him saying, oh, I've got a slight headache and Jesus says, well, I think I can help you there. Or people come in saying, oh, I think I've got one leg shorter than the other, I've got a bad limp. We're, not, we're talking about people who are, who are born blind and he opens their eyes, they're deaf, he opens their ears. There are the lame who've never walked and they're leaping for joy. And here come the sour Pharisees saying, oh, give us a sign from heaven. What more proof do they need? And of course, that's the point. That's the point that Mark is making. As far as the Pharisees are concerned, Jesus is only as good as his last performance. Okay, you've done some miracles, so we're told. But I think I might have seen something you didn't. Okay, maybe, but... Uh, how can we be sure? We want more proof. Anyway, maybe you cast out demons by the prince of demons. Maybe you're in league with the devil. So they say, a sign from heaven to test him. In other words, they're not disbelieving and give us more evidence and we'll believe. That might have been my world champion gymnast. You might have said that and I thought, mm, okay. But now I've got the evidence. I was disbelieving. Now I believe. They're not disbelieving, they're unbelieving. That no matter what Jesus does, no matter how much evidence he gives, these are men who will refuse to believe. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. In their heart of hearts, these men hate Jesus. 
These men refuse to believe. And no amount of proof that Jesus gives them is going to make them change their minds. I remember the feeding of the 5,000. Here's Israel's shepherd king. There are 12 baskets of leftovers. There's more than enough for all of Israel. More than enough if they would only come to Jesus and bow the knee. Well, here is some of Israel, the Pharisees. But they won't come. They won't bow the knee. And in so doing, they'll be shut out of the blessings. Verse 12. And Jesus, he sighed deeply in his spirit. And said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Jesus saying, what can you do? If you were really interested, if you really wanted to know, you have had proof enough. And with that he walks away. There's nothing more to say. What can you say to people who refuse to believe? Verse 13, and he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. And so to our final episode, episode number three. They all get back in the boat, and there's a mini crisis. Who's got the bread? Peter, have you got the bread? I haven't got it. John, have you got it? I haven't got it. James, Thomas, have you got the bread? Verse 14, they say, oh, (laughs) We've forgotten to bring the bread. It's that sense, isn't it? Don't say we've forgotten to bring the sandwiches. We've only got one loaf. And while they're looking at each other, and you know what, you know what men are like when they come to the realization that they haven't got any food, Jesus cautions them, doesn't he? Verse 15. He says, Watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And the disciples think when they hear the word leaven, well, that's yeast, isn't it? Yeast, leaven, Jesus must be talking about bread. He must be talking about the fact that we forgot to to bring the sandwiches, that we haven't brought any bread. Verse 17, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? And then there are these eight quick-fire questions. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he says to them, do you not yet understand? See what Jesus is saying? There's There's a degree of exasperation, isn't there? He said to them, hasn't the penny dropped? Would I really be saying to you, talking to you about the lack of bread? If I can feed 5,000 people with five loaves, and I can feed 4,000 people with seven loaves, if I can feed um, 9,000 people with 12 loaves of bread, and there's more than enough for everyone, there's an abundance, I'm sure that one loaf in the boat for 13 of us is going to (laughs) suffice. Are you really, so haven't you got it yet, says Jesus. Of course he's not talking about the fact they've only got one loaf and someone's forgotten to bring the bread. So what does Jesus mean? Watch out, he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He's referring to what we've just seen, isn't he? Here are the Pharisees. And uh, the Herodians, the followers of Herod, are no different. We'll come across those later. Here are the Pharisees. And they refuse to believe in Jesus. They refuse to bow the knee. They refuse to trust and obey Not for lack of proof, or there's there's proof enough that he's the the shepherd king, he's Messiah. They won't bow the knee because in their heart of hearts they hate Jesus. They're not disbelieving and give us a bit more evidence and we'll believe. They are unbelieving and no amount of proof that Jesus supplies is going to make them change their minds, it's going to make them move one inch. These men are willfully, consciously, knowingly 
blind. They are shutting their eyes tight to what they can see. They are putting their fingers in their ears to what they can hear. They refuse to see. They refuse to hear. And says Jesus now to his disciples, his slow disciples who don't seem to get it. He's saying to them, watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The yeast of the Pharisees. A little yeast leavens the whole loaf. A little yeast goes a long way. A little unbelief. Oh, I don't believe I'm... Says so Jesus has a massive effect. A little sprinkling of unbelief in your life. And it will affect how you live and where you will spend eternity. Richard Dawkins is an atheist. Richard Dawkins is a scientist. Which came first? Does his science inform his atheism or does his atheism inform his science? Well, before he was a scientist, he was an atheist. And he views the world through the lens of his atheism. Which is why, in the face of every evidence to the contrary, he refuses to believe. It set his life on a course. And it set his life, unless God saves him, it, it's not just this life that he's living now, but it's eternity upon which these things hang. That's what Jesus is saying. It's unbelief. Watch out. Beware that sprinkling of unbelief. Because it will destroy you. Well, as we close, let's put it all together. Maybe this evening you're a bit like Jesus' disciples. You get it, but you don't get it. You know that this Jesus is special, that he's different, he's important. Maybe it made sense tonight when you thought, yeah, actually, you don't have to be born into these things for these things to be important. You thought, yeah, that makes sense to me. And the thought of somebody able to fill your emptiness, that makes sense to you. And you kind of see it. It's sort of, it's sort of beginning to, bits are coming together. Maybe things have, people have said to you and you sort of think, oh, I, I think, I think I'm beginning to get it. You know, verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And you're thinking, well, I think I see some things, but I don't really see it clear. I, I think I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm not quite sure. Well, if that's you, then the word to you this evening is, is come closer. Because as you can see from Jesus' disciples, these are the ones who have been with him, sometimes these things take time. So Jesus says, come closer, come closer. If you, if you can't quite hear, well, come closer so you can hear. If you can't quite see, well, look, come here. I'll give, you a better, I'll give you a better place to stand so you can see more clearly. Hopefully you would have been given a Mark's Gospel when you came in tonight. Well, take that home with you. And maybe you know Christians. Well, talk to them. Ask questions. Say, you know, I want to know more. What's it all about? Tell me, tell me. What, what does the preacher mean? Jesus fills our emptiness. Can you tell me? Has he filled your emptiness? Ask questions, and don't feel any question is too small or too silly or feel a bit embarrassed about it. Ask the questions. And maybe we, we run Christianity Explored courses. Maybe you think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the first one of those and just see what it's like. It's very easy, low-key, discussing things. Come on a Sunday evening. Go to the website, listen to sermons, read books. But most of all, ask Jesus himself. Say, Lord, I... I'm not sure I can really see. Open my eyes so I can see. I, I think I hear what you're saying, but I can't quite hear. So open my ears so I can hear. I understand this is too important to miss. So Lord, show me. And the wonderful thing is he will. His promise to you is that if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, it'll be given to you. If you knock on his door, he'll open it wide with open arms. So, if tonight these things have struck a chord, but you can't quite see it all, don't worry, just come closer, come closer, and ask Jesus himself to make it clear to you. 
But maybe this evening you're in, you're in a different sort of place. And actually this evening you're in great danger. Because this evening you're like the Pharisees. And Jesus is warning you. He's saying to you, watch out. Strong words, isn't it? Watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Maybe this evening you know Jesus is Messiah. You know he's the Savior. You know he's the Shepherd King. You have proof enough. But actually what you're saying to yourself is, I need one more sermon to persuade me. I need one more change life. Maybe I need to see one more baptism to prove to me it's true. I need one more reason to believe. I, actually, I need a sign from heaven. I need a, I need a something. But you see, it's not proof that you need. You have proof enough. You're just unbelieving. The fact is you don't want to believe. You refuse to believe. You know he died on the cross to save sinners, but you're saying to yourself, I don't want to be saved. You've never doubted the empty tomb that he rose from the dead on the third day, but you're saying, I don't want to believe. That even now he's exalted to heaven at God's right hand where he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. But you're saying, I don't want to bow the knee to Jesus. And how many times has he in the preaching opened his arms and said, come to me. And you felt it. You felt the pull. You felt the draw. But then you said, oh, I need a sign from heaven. I need more proof. And he's filled your life with good things, so many rich, full blessings, and you say, oh, I'm lucky. And then there'll be those times he sent warnings, and he's shaken up your life, and things have gone wrong, and you said, oh, I've been unlucky. And Jesus says, watch out. Beware that sprinkling of unbelief, the leaven of the Pharisees, because it affects everything, it twists everything, it sets your life on a trajectory that ends up in hell. And maybe, my friend, how long before Jesus sighs deeply? Maybe he even turns away because you refuse to believe. It's not more proof that you need. You to fall on your knees before it's too late and cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let's sing a hymn. Well, maybe as you've been hearing God's Word, maybe verse 3 of hymn 529, maybe you can identify that. Lord, I believe, help now my unbelieving. I believe, but I'm, I come in faith because your promise stands, your word of pardon and of peace receiving. All that I am, I place within your hands. Let's sing 529.
believe and help our unbelieving. And we pray that, Lord, you would draw us irresistibly to yourself. Lord, call us by name. May we hear, even this night, the voice of the shepherd. And, Lord, may all the unbelief and all the resistance and all the excuses, may they, as it were, fall from us. And that, Lord, you would come and meet with us and fill our emptiness and conquer us this night, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.